I am your host of Across Generations, Tiffany D. Cross, and this is the only place where you will hear three different perspectives from three distinct generations of Black women, and I'm so thrilled to invite you to this conversation. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Across Generations. And today we have a very exciting topic to talk about, marriage. So before we get into the conversation, I want to start with the marriage rates in America. They have actually been on the decline since the latter half of the 20th century. And collectively, we're all marrying at a later age. But here's the interesting thing. The decline of marriage and delay are even more dramatic among us, among Black folks. That's all according to the latest U.S. Census. Now, in 1970, just over 35 percent of black men and 27 percent of black women were never married. But by 2020, these percentages had jumped to 51.4 percent for black men and 47.5 percent for black women. Now, why do we think that is? I'll tell you personally, I didn't grow up looking at bridal magazines or planning what my wedding would look like, but I certainly desired a life partner. And I wonder what the correlation is between marriage and love, because these are not the same things. Both seem to be more elusive in our community, and that makes me sad. People seem to desire it less and less, and we know there are benefits to marriage. You can start building wealth earlier. Having a life partner can enhance your health, career, and, and lifespan. And it can be beautiful, but I do wonder now with smartphones and Instagram scrolling and things like pornography at our fingertips, does it erode the desire for partnership, actual partnership? The data shows that famous statistic that everybody loves to quote that half of all marriages end in divorce. And that is true. Now, the average, but that's the first marriage and the average length of that first marriage before you get divorced is eight years. So I do wonder, why aren't people getting married? Why are those who do get married divorcing? What do the wise have to teach us about marriage? And what do the young have to reveal to us about their views on partnership? And for me, I've been contemplating if you're not combining balance sheets, if you're not trying to have children, if you're comfortable in your own space, what does love and partnership look like at this age? I have some thoughts. And quite frankly, though, I'm really looking for some guidance on some of these things. So please. Let's get into it. I am so thrilled to be joined um, by Miss Sade. She is uh, a 31 year old podcaster and an entrepreneur. Very happy to have you here with us, Sade. Thank you. And we have Mrs. Tate. Uh, now, Mrs. Tate is 81 years old, a former software developer. Proud mother of two, but here's the most impressive thing she's been married for 61 years. So amazing. You're not married, you're dating. Married for 61 years. I'm in the middle. I'm looking for advice from you both. Uh, Mrs. Tate, I want to start with you because 61 years, I mean, that's amazing. Mm. I, when I was younger and people would say how long they were married and then the audience would applaud, I never got that. Now that I'm older, I understand why people look at it like an accomplishment. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your marriage. Well, first of all, I got married when I was 18 <clears throat> and I... I think I mentioned before at Howard University, I was back then, I was pregnant when we got married. So it was a taboo. I mean, those are things that you really had to do or your Mm -hmm. parents would try to work something out. So I was pregnant when I got married. But I'd like to say, I think my husband and I were definitely in love because it was a thing about love at first sight with the with the both of us when we met at Howard University. I clearly remember I had gone to a party with my girlfriend and we were coming down the stairs and my my and Bob he was there and our eyes clicked and for some reason it was something was going on. And I walked down the stairs and he walked over to me and grabbed my hand and we just started dancing. And we left that party together We hadn't said a word to each other, and we left. I didn't have sex with him that night. (laughs) No judgment if you did. No judgment if you did. I'm impressed with Mr. Tate's game if you did, but no judgment. (laughs) So, so, but you always wonder when being pregnant, you always wonder, I wonder, are we married because Mm. I was pregnant or because we loved each other that much, it, it always kind of lingers mm. in in your mind. And I think after sixty one years, I think I got, we do love each. I love yes. him more today than I 
I did back then. Really? And of course, we had our rough patches along the way, like most marriages do. That, yeah. that testimony, I started out by saying, you know, I'm wondering what it looks like. But hearing you say that, it does make me desire a partnership even more um, to hear you, you talk about that. 61 years. That's a really long, yes. long time. Um, this concept of love at first sight, it makes me wonder about the correlation between love and marriage, because I just said the two are not always the same. Um, in some marriages, I feel like they're mutually exclusive. Some people just stay together. But it sounds like you and your husband, 61 years later, you make a conscious decision every day to still be there and in love with each other. It, in a sense, it was a conscious decision because when my daughters, I was working at the time, and then I had to, we're young because he was, I was 18, he was 21, an only child. He was so a little, a little kind of not spoiled, but you know. So some of the things, and I remember sitting talking with my daughters, and they were like maybe like six or seven at the time, and he had done something crazy. And I, and I sat them down, and I said, you know, Janine Deidre, I'm thinking about very seriously, I'm, I'm going to leave your father. We're going to leave your father. And they looked at me and said, what? <laughs> they, they said, and Deidre and my younger daughter said, she said, okay, mom, and my older daughter, Janine, said, then who's going to take care of daddy? We can't just break. And when she said that, I said, well, there goes the part for better or worse. Mm. So I said, okay. So I made a commitment. I said, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to, you know, work on and work past whatever it is that we're going through. Wow. Yes. There's a story there, and I'm going to get it, but I'm going to come back to that. Okay. <laughs> I have so many more questions about that. Yes. Um, I want to bring Shade into the conversation, yes. our younger guest here. Now, Shade, you're dating someone, mm -hmm. right? You guys are in a, an exclusive relationship? Yes. And do you, do you want to get married? I do. I do. Um, it took me a while to kind of come to that because I grew up with my mom really emphasizing that, like, yes, marriage is beautiful. Like, my parents were married, but she's like, ultimately... In this day and age, it's it's a business. It's like a contract. So if you are getting into a situation, you need to be mindful of like, this person could get your assets, your home, like other things. And so I've always been like, well, if I don't need to get married on paper, maybe I won't. I've looked up like the, um, you could be in a, like a long-term agreement and then you could get paperwork that like, if I need to take care of him in the hospital or something like that, I could do that. I've literally looked into that. And I was like, you know what? At the end of the day, I think I'll I'll do it. You do want to get married. Yeah. But it's interesting to hear you talk about it. Like, it's like a business, you know, like yeah. it's a contract. Yeah. And not a life partnership and like a spiritual, mental, emotional connection. I think that you can have that type of a connection with so many people. It doesn't necessarily just have to be the person you decide to marry. I think when you do jump into marriage, at least from my perspective, it is definitely a conscious decision that you are splitting something from like a business perspective mm -hmm. because we could just be together and it could be very casual and we don't have to do go down to the courthouse and have a piece of paper binding us um and so i've really kind of gone back and forth on those thoughts but i think it is something that would mean a lot more so to him you know it's, it's interesting hearing the two of you your perspectives on it and the way you describe it is very different and i want to get into um how our collective perspectives on marriage have changed through the decades and the generations we just talked about how it's a steady decline in the black community specifically and i gotta say i think our superpower has been that structure our family unit our mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. um and so seeing those statistics i i'm questioning what is happening with us uh that we are choosing mm. to not partner um, we know that you were with child, um, but you're saying, yeah, I would still choose my, my husband today. What is it about your partnership that has sustained over six decades? Mm. I think, well, to me, marriage is like a lifetime of compromise and uh, rearrange priorities. So that's something you have to always keep in mind that it's not just you in this marriage, you have a, a partner. So you have to come to some common ground on things. I, I, I really, I think that's very, very important. Yeah. And um, I think basically it's a lot of compromise mm -hmm. and a lot of rearranging of priorities. Yeah. 
You know, it's an interesting quote. Uh, Latasha Richardson is the wife of Sam Jackson. And someone asked her, how did you maintain your marriage all these years? And she said, it requires a lot of amnesia and a lot of forgiveness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think about that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, there there have to be times where, where you wonder. Um, and I know me personally, I um, I don't have a lot of either. <laughs> I, I don't mm -hmm. have a lot of amnesia and I don't have a lot of forgiveness. Something I need to work on, obviously. Um, I mean, I date. Mm -hmm. um, I am not in an exclusive relationship. And it just feels like um, both are slipping away from us. You know, like it, it seems like with, with my generation, your generation has a different attitude. In my generation, um, it, it, sometimes it feels like you show up to the table with animus. You know, what mm -hmm. does this person want from me? Um, you know, this uh, men have a, an, an attitude sometimes of, you know, what are you trying to get from me? Or, you know, as there's, there's history and like bitterness built up. Yep. Um, I think women come to the table like, why won't you let me love you? You know, <laughs> um, and I just I'm trying to figure out how to bridge that divide. Your generation, though, I have to say it's it does not seem I'm like concerned. they value partnership at all. I really don't know what happened. Um, I talk about this a lot on our podcast. Like, it seems... Okay, don't get me wrong. I know I said I think marriage, you know, ultimately it is a contract and you do need to be able to go into a situation saying, like, are we going to do this? Because if the IRS come and you done done something stupid, like, mm -hmm. I don't want to be attached to it. But at the same time, I think my generation specifically is so obsessed with money and finances. And it's like unrealistic. I'm like, what happened to just like a nice man who had a stable job, but everybody want to be a city girl and mm -hmm. everybody wants to be taken care of and they want a soft life, but no one's thinking about the compromise. I think that's the decline. I think that's where the disconnect is happening. Like people don't want to compromise. Everyone thinks it's going to be this perfect situation, which we know it's not. And they're yeah. looking for something that's unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Like I think Mich Michelle Obama was talking about this. She was like, people don't want to do the work. They just want like the wedding and the flowers and the right. pretty, and then they're done. Yeah. And and that's, I think that's why my generation, unfortunately, is very confused. They've gotten caught up in the material. Well, one of one of my favorite books that I read, um, Finding Me by Viola Davis, it was mm. such an amazing book. And she talks about um, love and partnership um, and marriage and how she had to, you know, love herself. And she quotes an episode of Golden Girls in the book where um, Dorothy Zbornak is saying um, she wants someone to grow old with mm. and that's the part that so many younger people don't like we want the cute we want the sweet and the fun um but you know we we all might not look like mrs tate when we're 81 you know but listen like, <laughs> your, your body changes your face changes yep. you gain weight you lose weight you get sick you lose your hair i when i had um fibroid surgery i was losing my hair mm. and i dealt with that you know by myself it grew back thankfully mm -hmm. but so at the time uh, you get moles and hair grows yep. out of them, you know, like you just grow old. And I I fear um, that this younger generation that chases, you know, people who look like mannequins on Instagram, they are not even prepared for that. Because we have such a, um, a, a seasoned, experienced woman here, what advice do you give us as young women, younger women um, who want to get married, but maybe we don't know what we're signing up for? It's not a long first date. It's a life commitment. Mm. Well, I think you, for young women today, they have a lot more options. When I was young, you were expected and to get married. You go to high school and not even necessarily go to college if you're a woman. Mm -hmm. And you, you get married and you have children. And nowadays, I think one of the reasons why <clears throat> uh, that number is dwindling is because women, especially black women, are the most progressive in terms of graduating from college and in their careers and everything. It's not like you have to have a man to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas when I was younger, there are a lot of women to take care. Of, they needed a husband mm -hmm. to financially exist in this world. Whereas you don't, you don't have that now. And also when I was coming, maybe when I was in my twenties or thirties, the emphasis was on not me too. It was the me generation looking out for number one. Mm. So I think the whole mentality, that had something to do with the mentality of being married. And it has impacted that also. Mm -hmm. That is not something that you have to do. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I but I, I don't feel like I have to get married yeah. um, at, at this big age in life, but it is a, a desire um, I have and something that um, I've navigated in dating. I'm sure you're going through this um, with, with the young man you're dating, but it, we talked about this a, a little bit before. It's um, a whole other person, you know? It's a whole other human being who has a whole different perspective and the thing that surprises me most about intimacy with another person outside of physical intimacy, but this person can ruin my whole day, you know, with a text message or a phone call. Mm -hmm. This person can make a decision that casts a dark shadow over my week. And that kind of like open, raw um, access to me is intimidating. You know, it's frightening. And it's like, I'm giving you every tool to hurt me. And I'm mm. trusting that you will not. Mm -hmm. That it requires a lot of trust. Do you have that kind of trust with your man? It's something that I'm working on. And it's funny that you said that because I just was talking to my therapist about this. It's a level, level of vulnerability that I've never wanted to have and be so open. Um, I'll give you a little story. Like we got into an argument on, over the silliest thing, like where we were going to go on a date. And he like changed where it was going to be. And I was like, but I planned it. And now you're trying to do something else. Like, this is so unfair. You're not thinking about how I'm thinking about it. And so I just shut down completely. And I was like, we're not going nowhere. And I'm about to go out with my friends and I'm not even going to come home. And I just wanted to go straight to like anger and resentment and to make him feel bad. And then I realized I didn't have the vulnerability to say, you hurt my feelings. And that was really what it was. Yeah, I think that's very important because a lot of time we take for granted women communicate differently with each other mm -hmm. than men and women. And a lot of time with men, you have to be, if it's something on your mind, it might, it's the last thing on their mind. It's <laughs> not, you can't sit there and be angry. You need to have a conversation mm -hmm. and explain to, if something bothers you, you need to discuss it and talk about it. And after a while, they'll, you know, they'll get what you've, where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of time we just expect men to automatically be perfect. And maybe if they were single or on their own, their behavior would be perfect. But then you have to, like, it's two of us here, so mm -hmm. it's give and take. Yeah. But if it's something bothers you, just have the conversation with them. And, and it's very surprising how a light bulb will turn on and yeah, you know, and, and that issue may go away. Yeah, um, Mrs. H. Shade made a good point though about hurt feelings, and I'm curious from you after 61 years. Clearly, there's been some hurt feelings at some point in your marriage. I'm sure. Um, if you can recall a time where you were the most hurt by your husband, he hurt you the most, cut you the deepest. How did you can share what you want to about that time? Um, but how did you survive that pain? How did you uh, get past it? Well. Uh, I would say when we were young, we went through, but also when my daughters got older and they were off to college and everything, and I remember clearly being home one night and my husband wasn't there and I was just sitting in the bed and I said, wow, it was like so quiet in here. It was just me and my thoughts. And I said, wow, this is a whole new phase of life that I'm going through. And so now it made me have to pay more attention to my relationship with my husband, which when you're raising children, a lot of times you miss like a lot of things. So uh, things weren't running smoothly or anything. And we, we hung in there for a while. But by the time my daughters had graduated, he, he and I just were not on the same page. And we... and separated. Now, and it took a while for him. He was supposed to leave, but he didn't leave. So I was the one that went and looked for an apartment and I left. And to show you something about my husband, he's very funny. Everybody loves him. He's, he has a great sense of humor he, and he is very, very charming. Uh, so when I looked for an apartment, I took my little grandson with me, Rob, Robbie. We went, I was looking at apartments and he was about three years old. And then when we came back home, everybody was home. He said, grandma and I found an apartment and we're moving. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a sitcom. Yeah. yeah. But we were, sep we were separated for a while. And I clearly remember my husband calling me one day because my older daughters were still with him. The three, they were living together. Mm -hmm. Both of them graduated for college, all of their friends by the house and everything. 
And then my husband, he called me on the phone and he said, Sandy, how come I got custody of the kids? So I looked at the phone. I said, what kid? They're 24 and 23 right. years right. old. But like with him, I think the humor, and after a while, the, he is so funny and yeah. so charming. And today, we have the best relationship that mm. we've ever had. We finally found our way back to each other. And I think it was through our grandsons had a lot to mm. do with it, too. Did you ever do therapy? Uh, no. No therapy. No therapy. So what? So you said your grandkids, but what was the conversation between you and your husband? Like, how did you reconnect? How did you find your way back to each other? Well, slowly but surely, we... We would run into, because we still did a lot of things together as a family. You know, we, we we still did all of those things together. And through the years, it seemed like he started recognizing, putting me, like he had more empathy and insight mm -hmm. into me and curious and really interested in what I was doing. So mm -hmm. he showed genuine interest in me. And then after a while, we just became even better friends and we finally you know, got back together and said, we'll give this another try. Yeah. And it's worked out so fine. He is my my Prince Charming that I thought I had a long time. I wow. have him now. What was better, the first half or the second half? The second half, yes. And you wouldn't have known that had you not yes. stuck mm -hmm. it out. I think that's so interesting about just being, you know, authentic and transparent with someone. Um, I dated someone also for a long time in my twenties and my thirties, I would literally pretend to be someone else. Mm. Um, I, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't someone contrary to who I was, but I would show up and pose, you know, I would, I was always together. Um, I would, you know, turn the brain on. I was only saying like, you know, the most highbrow things and it wasn't until I was in my 40s and met someone and I was my most authentic self, my most transparent self. I will throw a tantrum if I want to. He will see me cry, um, all of these things. And we it, it was intimidating to me. You know, it was intimidating um, because I felt so naked. I felt so emotionally naked. But then it was also comfortable, you know, <laughs> like right. this is the most comfortable I can be with somebody to get maybe TMI. I had never even walked around unclothed in front of anyone wow. before. Yeah, I, because I always wanted to look perfect. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, I was just walking around. I'm a virgin, Miss Tate, obviously. Um, no, I'm kidding. Anyway, but I I felt comfortable, you yeah. know, I was like I'm going to be, you know, who I am. And to do that the first time in my 40s um, was interesting and it just made me so much more open, but also so much more emotional. So I'm just curious in, for the younger folks who are always like primmed and, you know, looking their best yeah. on Instagram. Like, how is it being your authentic self um, relating to an, another human being? I think for me, it. I've always felt very comfortable being myself because I was so raised to feel comfortable in my skin. But I look at a lot of my girlfriends and I can see that. Like they feel as though they have to play a role that's like digestible or attractive or seems cool. Whether that's, you know, your stereotypical looking perfect on Instagram or if, you know, they are a writer, they're like, I need to be up on the best books and I need to, you know, make him think that I know everything right. about every new right. like topic. Or if they're into music, they're like, I need to know every song and everything. And I'm like, this, this is not sustainable or real. But I think because we're constantly just consuming content that seems so perfect, mm -hmm. everyone thinks that's what they need to be. And it really then, you're, you're not even being yourself, you're fake. Right. And now this person's trying to peel off layers and really get to know you. And then you honestly, I feel like you lose yourself. So I'm very jealous of your generation <laughs> yeah. that didn't have to deal yeah. with Instagram and that. Tinder and all yeah. these Swiping things. right or left Swiping on right and left. It makes people feel like they're disposable. Exactly. You know, like they're yeah. not real human beings. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, that does affect your behavior, whether if people like something or not. I, I remember... Um, one of the best lessons I learned from my dad, and I remember this clearly, I was at my grandmother's house and the neighbors next door had all the kids I used to play with them. But this time I, I didn't want to play with the girl next door because my aunt had 
taking paper bags and she did my hair where I had all of these curls and everything in this beautiful dress. And I said, well, I don't really want to play with them today because they don't look as nice as I'd mm. look. And then I looked at my father, I was a little girl, and he looked at me and the look in his eyes said, I, I could tell that he was not pleased mm -hmm. with you know what I was saying. And I, to the day, even when I got older, I thanked him for pointing that out to me because I would have missed so many great opportunities in life by judging people by their looks or by their how much money they have or anything like that. You, that, that was a great lesson I learned from my dad. Yeah, that's yes. such a good point. Um, Y'all know the streets are talking all the time about yes. relationships. Always. Everybody, I, every time I scroll on Instagram, some is a new relationship guru, some self-declared person spitting that Instagram knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, and I will caution people, talk to somebody with some letters behind their names, you know, if you really want advice. Or our elders. I think, you know, mm -hmm. nothing can, um, can, can substitute just days spent on this earth and, you know, someone who's been married 60 plus years. Um, so with well, somebody who I think has always had really interesting thoughts on, um, self-love and being self-full, um, with just you by yourself is Tracy Ellis Ross. So she's sharing, um, some thoughts on why she is choicefully single. So I want you guys to take a listen and we can talk about it on the other side. I, like many of us, was taught to grow up dreaming of my wedding, not of my life. And also waiting to be chosen. Well, here's the thing. I'm the chooser, and I can choose to get married if I want to, but in the meantime, I am choicefully single, happily, gloriously single. And I do wish there were more examples. So many people ask the question, have you ever thought about having children? My child gave my life meaning. I'm like, are you saying my life is not meaningful? Okay, so um, I thought Tracy Ellis Ross raised a really good point um, because even in society, it's like men are the choosers. Um, I have been, you know, quote unquote chosen before. I don't know that I've ever chosen someone else. Um, you know, I have recently, but it's, you know, we're not an exclusive relationship, but I felt like, oh, I would choose you. Um, and that's so important for us as women, you know, yeah. like, do you choose me? And do I choose you in coming together um, uh, uh, under that auspice? And who who did the choosing, do you think, with you and your husband? You, in my relationship? Mm -hmm. um, I My husband, I, he chose I would you. say. Your husband yeah. chose you. In your relationship. This is a funny story. Um, so I've always had a crush on my boyfriend. Like mm -hmm. I've known him for years um, and he would DJ at different spots. And so I would literally drag my friends and be like, we're going uptown. We're going all over the city. He's DJing here. He's DJing there. And this boy paid me no mind. Like he'd be like, hey. And I'd be like, damn. Like he doesn't, he, he's not seeing it. And then one day we hung out and I saw him as a friend. And I'm, I'm just talking like we're friends, literally going on my rants about how I feel about monogamy and just like, he's a girlfriend. And he was like, I wanted to show you that the way you were thinking was really twisted. And so I wanted to be with you and show you like what a good relationship could look like. So in a way he chose me, yeah. even though I stalked him. I, but that is something about, you know, I think younger women today, like younger yeah. women will do the choosing. And I'm in, you know, in between these generations where I feel like I, I am an analog girl living in a digital world, mm -hmm. you know, like you, because when I'm doing the choosing, um, the dynamic is off now. You know, if I feel like um, the man in this position, you you might feel a little emasculated at times, yeah. you know, like you choose me, make it clear, make it obvious, slap me across the face with it. Now, one thing I will say about exposing yourself to somebody in that way um, one thing I learned about myself, I can say some ugly things when I am so open and honest and in love with someone and they hurt my feelings. The things that I can spew, I have surprised myself because I am so deeply hurt. I'm curious in your marriage, um, can you recall a time where you did or said something to your husband? It was below the belt. It was so hurtful and you wish you could take it back. Did that ever occur? And if it did, how did you get past it? So you would have to ask him. <laughs> Fair because enough. I don't believe that I ever did that because mm -hmm. I'm very mindful about the
the things that I say. And maybe, like I'm saying, I used to be a programmer, so maybe it's just logic mm -hmm. in terms of the way that I think. Because I also, like if I'm feeling something and say if you might get a tinge of jealousy about something or anger, to me, that's the best time to grow. If you take a moment to really think about why you're angry or why you're jealous or whatever these feelings are, sometimes you come up with a different answer. It's not really against the person that said something, but it could be something that you don't have in your life right. or you're lacking that you're jealous. Not so why are you jealous of this person? Yeah. If yeah. you want to be like that, then do something so you can reach that goal. Mm -hmm. And those are my fit in terms of how to manage the way that I the way that I feel about things. And you said a key word there, um, being logical. Mm -hmm. And um, emotions are not always logical. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, something um, a dear friend of mine, Latasha, tells me is be judicious with your words. You know, and I that is a lesson I'm still learning at this point because I haven't lived with anybody. I've never been married. And it's, you know, quite frankly, um, somebody who stands by me and that and says, yes, I make room for your personhood. I know that you say these things. I try to... Um, be mindful of that, but it's a lesson I haven't quite learned yet. We've been talking a lot about marriage and relationships, um, but I am mindful of all the single women out there who are not in a relationship. They're they're not married, and I just wonder um, how much does your relationship define you as a human being, as a woman? Like, if your husband did go away, um, does that take part of your existence and who you are? Like, who would you have been just as an individual? That's a very hard question. I never really, I never really thought about it, but <clears throat> I would, I would like to think I would be basically the same person that I am now, but maybe with a lot more time to do things that are not confined within the family or Outside, especially when you get old, especially being older, mm -hmm. because you're no longer taking care of, of children, uh, doing those kind of things. So I would say the big difference would be being older. And I'm, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. I'm really not. I'd imagine it's hard after yeah. being with someone since you were 18. Yeah. So it really is defining. It is. Um, you know, it it strikes me that some women define their entire existence mm -hmm. by being able to attract a man or attract a husband. Um, could you be happy um, if you never got that, that you know, if, if you were never chosen by yeah. your, your boyfriend, if, if you were single the rest of your life, mm -hmm. do you think you would be okay? If I were to lie to myself, I'd say yes. Mm -hmm. But if I were to be like very honest, I don't think so. Um, not in the sense of not being chosen, but wanting that companionship, like just wanting that person to come home to. Like I, even now, like I'll be out all day and I'm so excited to come home to someone. Mm -hmm. um, but I, in that same vein, I feel like it shouldn't have to define you. I feel like people should continue to try to live their lives and have their fun and not always seek something. And and I truly do think that things happen to you when you're not actively looking for it, as like cheesy and cliche as that is. Mm -hmm. Like live your life and really develop who you are and who you want to be. Because if you're not being real with yourself or you haven't really found yourself, how's anybody going to really be able to mesh with you? I think your situation is a little different because you all grew up together. But now, you know, friends, 34, 35, you are yourself yeah. and and ideally that person who you find is accepting you for you and you and if that doesn't happen you're still comfortable with you yeah we're, yeah. we're starting relationships later yes as you know so different my you know peers started later your peers are starting yeah. even um later so yeah it, it is look i'll i'll say um for me i do not think it is natural to connect and invest with someone mentally, spiritually, and physically, and not care if it works out or not, you know, um, to just, you know, kind of be indifferent about it all. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it feels like in this younger generation, particularly, um, it's become kind of in vogue to, you know, just 
date multiple people and being different about the whole thing. Um, and I think that, to your point, goes against the human condition. You know, it's just not what it is. Um, and the expectations um, that, that younger people have, the new rules around dating. Um, I want to come back to something that you said uh, when you and your husband separated. Um, how long were you separated? I think we were separated about maybe seven or eight years. Years? Yes. Wow. That's a, I was I really thinking months when you said right. that. Oh, no. Years. When, when we actually time. separated, it, it would have been less than that. But the thing is that at one point, I moved to New Jersey to help my daughter. She got divorced, and I was there to help her with her son because she had, she had uh, you know, when she was in near uh, heading toward 40, and a very, very demanding career and the whole bit. So in essence, we were separated and coming back and forth because he was in Manhattan where our apartment was. So automatically, I was there in Jersey most of the time as backup for my daughter and to help with my grandson. You know, eight years is a long time to yeah. be apart from your spouse. And I imagine a lot of things can happen in nearly a decade. Um I'm curious in relationships, what are your deal breakers? Like what, because I feel like, you know, mm. we, sometimes people will swallow something that they're not really cool with, or, you know, you tolerate something in, in the bigger picture. Um, I guess it's a plain spoken way to say it is what does your husband get away with? You know, like what are the things that you say, I'm going to turn a blind eye. I'm going to forgive. I'm not going to see it as a don't ask, don't tell, especially during that separation time. Yes. I would basically say it was don't ask, don't tell. I never, I never questioned what he was doing because I really, if that, that was him. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm not that woman to try to follow him or do anything like that to catch See what he's doing because I have a lot that I'm doing myself. Mm -hmm. I, ha I have a life that I'm living. Um, you know, working. I had an and in fact, my husband and I, when we were separated, we invested in uh, the New Yorker Club. I don't know mm. if you ever heard of or heard of it, but um, the New Yorker Club was the first private club in New York City. It was a private club, and it was a limited part, and they had like about. 20 limited partners of which my husband and I were involved with. And, and all black people can come and have the events there. It was just a great, great idea. But we went bankrupt within a year. Mm. So there are a lot of different things that I tried when my daughters were older. I worked in an African restaurant uh, down on Chamber Street, Okapi, I was the general manager. And it just seems like everything that I've done has been initiated by someone else or a situation or somebody referred me to something because these are things ordinarily I would not have done mm -hmm. on my own. Yeah. But it's always challenging if you haven't done something or if it's afraid. Do it anyway. Mm -hmm. You might, you, you never know, you might like it. And I managed the African restaurant where the staff spoke French and everything. I did speak French, and one of the guys came back with a lot, a lot of wrong things on the lip because mm -hmm. of my French. So Etienne, the um, agent, assistant manager, he took care of all of the ordering yeah, and yeah. stuff. But it was one of the best experiences that I've ever had working in that restaurant. So there are a lot of different things that I was trying and doing yeah. during that time. And of course, being hands-on, helping with my grandson. Yeah. After eight years, I feel like you get used to your own life and your own routine mm -hmm. and, you know, coming and going in your own way. Um, so it had to be just real love that, yes. that brought you back to that, to adjust to that Yeah, again. it is. Because when I think about my husband, he's, he's so funny. He's so charming. And I can always, the picture that I have in my mind of him when Janine D was smaller, we used to go <clears throat> upstate New York, like a lot of times in the summertime. And I clearly remember one time we were upstate and we stayed in a trailer. In the nighttime, we would look at the stars and everything like that. And we went to the lake the next day. And all of a sudden, it got cloudy outside. It was dark. The sun went away. It was getting cold. And my daughters looked at their dad and said, Dad, could you just please make the sun come out? 
And my husband got up there, and he did all kind of weird things, like he was mm -hmm. a witch doctor and everything like that. And do you know the sun came out? <laughs> and I said, that man has made the sun come out for us ever since that time. I will never, ever, I will never, ever forget that. Wow. I need to say, my man, my man, my man. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so... I, I mean, if somebody's making the sun come out for you, that's gonna draw you back after <laughs> after eight years. Yeah. Um, what What are your deal breakers? Like, what can? It's different because marriage is different yeah. than a boyfriend. Yeah. Um, but do you, even as a boyfriend, like, what what can your man get away with? I'm a little more flexible. I like I like to live a don't ask, don't tell lifestyle. I'm mm -hmm. like, listen, on a bachelor trip, I don't need to know. Don't come home with nothing you didn't leave with. And yeah. that's kind of my perspective on it. But I think the biggest thing for me is trust. Like, don't sneak around. Like, if you're getting crazy with your friends, you want to yeah. go out all night and have a good time, fine. But, like, don't lie. Just mm -hmm. tell me what you're doing. I think if you break my trust and I feel like you're sneaking around and, like, trying to get one over on me, then I I don't appreciate that. But I think if you are open and honest and there's you know certain things you want to do or certain new things you want to try like yeah. I'm, I'm I'm I think I'm open um, well, as long as he's honest as long as so he's honest so if he comes back and he says listen I'm going to Miami mm -hmm. with the fellas um I we're going to be kicking it we're going to hit the the strip clubs as you do should all the things <laughs> Um, if something goes down, like I want some freedom this weekend. Yeah. If something goes down with a, a woman, I don't want to feel like I'm breaking some holy covenant with you. Right. I can't say what's going to happen, but it might. Yeah. And I want to be upfront with you and tell you this now. You say what? I'm open to that. Mm. I, I think that that needs to go both ways. I think sometimes men aren't as open about that type of stuff because mm -hmm. it feels a little more territorial. But I'm open to that. Um, I don't need all the details. I don't need to know her name. I don't need to know everything that you done did. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're like safe and smart, I, I understand. I don't necessarily be believe that someone could be with one person for their entire life. I don't know. I don't know. How. No, but monogamy <laughs> is something that you, you can adjust to with yeah, the rules. Yeah, but I, I think that there will be times where whatever we'll that looks like, there's flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say about that, Miss Tate? <laughs> um, I, I kind of think like, I, I never really, you know, you always try to stay positive and think about, I think with two daughters, a lot of time, that's the last thing on your mind. Mm. And see with my husband, <clears throat> his lifestyle was very different anyway because he has was always involved in in giving parties and events until today he's still working and he's 83 years old wow. but he's a consultant with the Harlem Chamber of Commerce and they still today he's doing events he loves doing those kind mm -hmm. of things so with him it's I don't know like mm -hmm. he's out as part of making money so yeah. that's a different situation mm -hmm. that I'm that I was yeah. in in terms of. And I got to say, if I'm in my 80s and I got to worry about my husband and what he's doing in these streets, no. like, I'm exhausted. <laughs> at that point, like, I'm exhausted. Because what do you say? You can't say grow up. <laughs> it's like, you're real grown already no, at that point. No, this is so. from his younger days. Because yeah. I find now that we're both senior citizens, uh, real senior citizens. Yeah. I, I would basically say this is the best part of our marriage. Because it's nice. When you get older... A lot of times, if you're older, you become invisible to people when you're past a certain age. Mm. And it's like only like your old friends and or your husband, you can relate to so many different things. In fact, I told my daughters, I said, you know what? When I was in Jersey, I noticed in all of this older white people were like extra nice to me and everything like that. And I just figured, I said, you know what? Maybe this is the first time in their life that they've ever been discriminated against and they can feel, you know, have more empathy for people that are older like them because you become like a non, you mm -hmm. become like a non-person, mm. but you're not that way with people your own age. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'll keep y'all posted on when I experience some white empathy, but yes, I take <laughs> yes. your point. Um, Shade, I, you have been saying... Um, that you've been sending your your boyfriend like pictures, like this the ring I want. This, oh like... yes, I have. It's that that's, time. Yeah, that so that to me that's very interesting because 
maybe y'all are both doing some choosing, but you're saying, no, it's time. Like we are. Yeah. How does that work? Essentially, you're saying it's time for you to propose to me. And that previously in your generation, for sure, mm-hmm. like men control that entire process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've had conversations uh, like flat out, like, would you marry me? Would you want to get married? What would you want to do? And he's like, yes, I would, I would marry you. I'd want to do all of those things. And so I'm like, great. Well, looking at, in, it, I'm being honest about biological clocks. Mm-hmm. I'm like looking at the timeline, how things want to go, how yeah. I'm kind of envisioning my life. I'd want to be married before I start to think about a family. And so I, I send those rings on over. I've sent some and he's like, these are hideous. No. Okay. And then others, he's like, okay, this will work. And I'm like, great. Some women are even proposing to men. Oh, no, 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 no. What, Miss Tate, what do you think? <laughs> well, what, what do you think about like, send, like, hey, here's the ring I want. Let's make this happen. Or like, Hey, brother, will you marry me? What do you think? I I think if a, I, I don't find a... I think that's fine nowadays yeah. to do that because these are really different, you know, different times. Yeah. So I think I have not a problem with women yeah. asking a man to marry them. Well... We're we're coming to our closing time, and I want to take a moment of personal privilege um, and get some advice from you before we go. Um, I am not in a committed relationship. I'm 44. I would like a life partner. I'm completely open to marriage and, and what that might look like. Um, I am working on the most important relationship with myself, um, and I want to be okay no matter what happens. Now, if I'm all into this man, this one person... Um, and you know, it doesn't work out. It's such a disappointment, you know, at the, at this point in life. And I'm just curious as a woman who's been married 61 years, you've gone through ups and downs, you were separated eight years. You've lived this very full life, um, as a mother, a wife, but also just as a woman, you know, take away all that as a woman, you have lived a full life. What advice would you have for me as I'm navigating, um, these issues being middle-aged? Well, I, would start with so don't define yourself as being middle aged first and foremost. It's just about being a woman and understanding where you're going and what what you want out of life and just how you put that effort into everything else. Put that same effort into into finding that person that's there for you. And it may not, it's not always the brightest bulb in the room. I think a lot Mm -hmm. of times women limit themselves. Uh, I clearly remember one time, I always have stories to tell. And this is a young girl, we were at a party and all the girls, we were all sitting around the table. And then there was the guy that came into the party and all of them said, oh, he's so nice. Everybody's so sweet. And another guy that was sitting at the table with us said, yeah, but he's not the one that any of you would date. You're always going with the ones that's the worst guys, the bad boys all the time. So like broaden your horizons Mm -hmm. and, you know, travel and look for, for, for diamonds in different places they're not always like down in a cave or a mine somewhere. They they're everywhere. Well, I hope I can find a yeah. diamond to make the sun come out for. But me. if <laughs> if you if you don't need, and not to and not to worry about it, I have friends today that have never been. They've never been married, never have children, and they're my age. They have a great life. They have plenty of money. They travel and do everything. And even I have uh, two girlfriends, and her daughter decided to get a townhouse together instead of them all separately spending all of this Mm -hmm. different money. And the three of them have their privacy and together. Not only are they saving a lot of money, but they have built a nice a nice, nice place for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you have people to look after you Mm -hmm. and somebody, you know, like cook or if you get sick or need somebody. So it's like they have a a community, a family Mm -hmm. within within themselves. I love that. Yes. This, uh, again, this conversation has fed my spirit. Um, I thank you both for sharing your stories. Um, this is why I like having younger people here because you've imparted knowledge as well. You know, your your path um, and representing how younger people view partnership and certainly um, your sage counsel on um, just living your life and uh, your experience as a wife has been amazing. Um, I, I want to close uh, the show by saying um, marriage is not 
one long first date. And um, when you think about marriage in terms of someone to grow old with, it is not the person that you're looking at now, but um, who you want holding your hand in those rough times when you lose your mother, when you're burying a parent, did you lose a child, when you're in cancer and, you know, in the hospital and can't wipe your own behind. Like that is the Mm -hmm. crux of what makes um, a marriage work. Um, and I look forward to having that, um, experience if that is God's plan for me. Um, but also, um, I think just the beauty and magic that come from, uh, finding someone who can make the sun come out for you on a cloudy day. So best wishes to all of you in your marriage and building beautiful black love, because that's been such a huge part of our superpower as a community. And if you're on that journey to find that love, generate that love here first. Someone gave me great advice and said, become love and then you will attract love. Mm. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Across Generations. And we look forward to talking to you next time.